talk about the uh, process that I went through and uh, you know, who are you? Where are you from? So yeah, I'm Kevin Tyson. I grew up in Bellevue, Washington. I attended the University of Washington. I was a baseball player there, uh, and was a baseball coach there for uh, five years, and just wrote a book about hockey. So, uh, which is you know kind of an interesting uh, existence, but it was really a fun process, and uh, it wasn't something I ever thought about doing. You know, I wouldn't say that writing a book was uh, a bucket list item for me. Uh, anything that you know, I, I set out to do. Uh, I was asked to help with the centennial in uh, January of 2017 with the Metropolitans, and the truth is I didn't even know that it happened, which was uh, pretty funny to me that someone who grew up in the sports community in Seattle and, and spent my pretty much entire adult life you know, uh, with Mariners, with the UW, and the Sports Commission, to not even know that the Metropolitans happened, and uh, or the story or any of that stuff was kind of Shocking to me. Um, we uh, you know, brought some artifacts out from the Hall of Fame in March of, of 2017 to really highlight the, the story and get it out to the masses. And it was pretty interesting. You know, when we first started, we didn't know if anyone was going to care or if anyone was going to acknowledge it or anything like that. And it was a huge media event. Uh, the New York Times picked the story up. We had long lines at uh, all the venues that we. Uh, where we had the artifacts and, and people were pretty engaged by it, which was pretty cool. Uh, you know, at that point, I thought it was uh, a really cool story. The first American team to win the Stanley Cup, and uh, that's all I knew at that point. I didn't know, uh, to be honest, anything about the players on the team. I didn't know if the team had only been here for a year. You know, if the team had been here for 20 years. I didn't know if people cared about uh, the Stanley Cup in 1917. You know, I kind of chuckled at one point and was thinking to myself, like. What if this is one of those things that happened, nobody saw it, nobody cared, 50 years later it became this really cool thing and you know, now we're trying to parade around and act like it was a big deal. Uh, you know, and I didn't really know what professional athletics looked like in 1917, that was another thing. And I'd had people make comments to me in the past about you know, different uh, baseball players in, in Seattle and things like that, about you, know, you really can't compare eras or, or generations, it's just such a different game. And, uh, so I had sort of all those thoughts going through my head as I uh, was you know, starting to look at the story and, and uh, I started pitching authors that I knew, right? Like everybody else, I had just read Boys in the Boat, it's a spectacular story, really cool uh, time period piece, uh, really cool sports story, uh, and I felt like that somebody needed to write the Metropolitan story, that this really uh, spectacular, phenomenal event had Heard and no one knew the story, right? So uh, I sent it off to some authors that I knew, hoping that someone would be engaged and excited and want to write the story, and I didn't get a response, right? And uh, at the time, I didn't understand why. I was kind of frustrated. I thought that, you know, this is, again, a story that needed to be told, and, and uh, sitting here today, I completely understand, you know, when people send me book ideas, I was like, okay, I, it sounds interesting. I, I don't know if I could emotionally handle, you know, everything that goes into writing a book, and so, I, I completely understand why uh, it's not a good response, right? So, uh, fast forward six months, and we were trying to get the Stanley Cup out the entire time to, to celebrate the centennial, and uh, the, the Hall of Fame wanted to bring the, the Cup out. It was also, 1917 is also the 100 year anniversary of the NHL being formed. So, the league prior to that is called the National Hockey Association. So, the Mets actually beat the Montreal Canadiens of the National Hockey Association. Uh, the big massive change between the NHA and the NHL is that the owners of the NHA did not like the owner of the Toronto franchise and they wanted to kick him out of the league and they couldn't do it and so they disbanded the NHA, turned around, walked into another hotel room and started the NHL with the same teams with the exception of Toronto wasn't in anymore and that's how the NHL is formed. Uh, so again, it's the 100 year anniversary of that and so they're taking the cup around to all the teams that had won it uh, and to celebrate all the uh, you know, 100 years of, of the NHL's existence. And so they weren't sure if they were going to be able to bring it out to Seattle. So we had a call in November of, 19, or of 2017, excuse me, uh, right around Thanksgiving that says we have a 24-hour window that we can bring the cup out on December 21st. And you know, do you guys want it or not? And I remember looking at the thing and thinking, like, this is going to be a train wreck. This is four days before Christmas. 
at the height of you know uh, all the holiday rush and, and advertising and everything, we're going to really struggle to get this out. Uh, we don't have any marketing budget. We don't have anything. Uh, you know what's going to happen? And, and then I turned and looked at the guy that wanted to bring the cup out and said, the flip side is it is the Stanley Cup and we should bring it out. You know, and just deal with it. Whatever happens, happens. Uh, Within 24 hours, all the media outlets in Seattle picked the story up. We had huge attention that the cup was coming. And I started to feel a little bit better at that point. Uh, and then the day that the cup is, is coming, we're, we're doing an event at uh, the WAC, and we're doing a showing at 9 o'clock. And I get to my office in the Sports Commission about 8.30, and I'm walking over to the WAC, and we make the decision that we're going to pull the cup out. Uh, Fifth and University, University, which is kind of the courtyard of the IBM building, which is where the, the ice arena was at that time. And we're going to take pictures of where the cup was actually won with the cup. And we're all standing on the corner, and the, the Stanley Cup's in this huge case that looks like a, you know, a musician's band case. And, and they pop it open, pull the cup out, and within 30 seconds we had 20 people standing on top of us. And then I start looking around, and you can see people running down the street. And you can look up the IBM building, and every floor there's people standing at, at each window looking down at the cup. And I turn around the Rainier Tower, and the same thing, people all the way up the tower looking down at the cup. And I just, I mean, I, my hair is standing on end right now. It was one of the craziest things that I've ever experienced to see the power of the Stanley Cup and, and the awe that people held for it. And uh, the, the entire day was magic, to be perfectly honest, right? And we go back to the whack, and the, the lines out the door. Uh, and it remains out the door the entire day, and uh, we end up having to just cut it off, and we we're taking the cup. We are supposed to stop at the Pike Place Market, and we had to cancel it because the line was so long at, at the WAC. We go straight to the Space Needle, and we get it up to the top of the Space Needle, and we were going to go to the very top, and we couldn't get the case out of the, uh, the ladder, right, where we decided we weren't going to drop the Stanley Cup. We weren't going to be the people that broke the Stanley Cup in Seattle. And so we just take it on the observation deck. And again, we get swarmed by people. Just all over us, everyone's trying to take pictures. Uh, and it, that was pretty neat. And then we take it to Cary Park. And so at this point, we're probably an hour late, uh, just with, with how difficult it was getting out of the, the Space Needle. And we park at Cary Park, and people start jumping out of cars and sprinting towards us. Uh, and that, that was, again, one of those moments where I had, like, I felt like I was hanging out with Mick Jagger. I mean, it was just with a rock star the entire day. Uh, and I was completely hooked at that point. You know, it's just like my mind starts spinning of like, how am I going to get this story out? How am I going to get someone to write it? And, you know, I was talking to my wife about it a lot. And she finally looked at me one day and was like, why don't you just write it? You know, and, and uh, kind of looked at her and laughed and, and thought about it for a few days and was like, you know what, I actually think that I might be able to do this. Uh, and yeah, luckily, you know, just having that sort of athlete's mentality of I can accomplish anything. Uh, you sort of jump in with two feet and get past a point of no return, of understanding how difficult the process it actually is going to be to, to write a book and research it and, and to do all that stuff. Um, again, fast forward a few months and it's February of 2018 now and uh, we've just had the Sports Star of the Year event. I'm sitting at my desk the next day, completely exhausted from the event, and uh, looking at my computer, trying to focus and trying to get some energy back. And I was like, I need to just do something different today. And so I got up and I walked over to the central library and put the microfilms in and started scrolling through and just wanted to know more about the story at this point. You know, like in my head, I was going to write the book. Uh, didn't know how I was going to actually do it. Uh, and, and just felt like, well, at least I can go and look and see what the story is, and if there's nothing there, then it's, it's easy to not have to write it. And, and I put it in, and I start scrolling forward, and I get to two days before game one of the Stanley Cup final, and the headline's like this big, and it says, Czar abdicates. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, you know, I mean, what are the odds that, uh, you know, an extremely pivotal point in history happens two days before game one of the final? So then I go two days forward and I start reading the game recap and I'm shocked to find out what happens in game one. Scroll forward, read games two, three, four, and you know the fifth game and I'm just looking through it and going like this is absolutely incredible. I can't believe that no one knows this story. I can't believe I don't know this story. And while I'm looking at all these, I'm, I'm also reading the headlines on page one and it's evident that the uh, the war, you know, the declaration is imminent, right? I mean it is really like heating up and 
all the headlines are war looms and you know Kaiser's threats and all these things. And so I pulled my phone out and Googled to see when we declared war on Germany, and it's six days after the Stanley Cup final ends, right? And that point, I was just like, okay, from whatever happens from here, there's a story, right? I don't know what it is, but there's absolutely a, a spectacular end to the story, and I just need to figure out the the front part of it, right? I mean, you need a two-week span where the Tsar advocates on one end, the U.S. declares war on Germany on the other end, and then this spectacular competitive uh, event takes place. Uh, luckily, as I started going backwards through the season, the story got better. Um, you know, it just really, uh, I realized that everything that I loved about sports and everything I loved about competing came out within the season. Uh, it was clear, really evident to me quickly that sports in 1917 were exactly the same as they are in 2017, 2018, 20, I mean, it's the same deal, right? No TV, you know, we don't have 7,000 sponsor logos everywhere, but the competitive aspects of it are exactly the same. To the people on the ice, it's the same experience that, that we have with our athletes today. The people in the stands had the same competitive experience, and, and uh, it, was, it was pretty magical. Uh, and then as I start to go back more, I started researching the individual players, right? And at this point, they'd all been dead for almost 50 years. Uh, there's no uh, journals, there's no first-person accounts of any of it, which made it really challenging. Uh, and, you know, it, it started off where I was just pulling newspaper articles. And even back then, there's not a lot of color added to uh, what's written. You know, there's not a lot of quotes from people. There's not a lot of uh, stories on individuals. It's just really factual uh, sort of game recaps. And so just keep digging and digging and digging and then I come to find out that the daughter of Frank Boyson, who's a star player, is still alive and, and I got the chance to interview her and she had a lot of really uh, good information about uh, a lot of the players. She didn't know a lot about the actual hockey side of it, but she knew a lot of the players emotionally and, and personality-wise and so that helped me sort of shape uh, you know, who they were going to be. Uh, the next thing I did is I started to assign a player to somebody that I had coached. You know, I think you, when you coach long enough, you start to see personality types uh, repeat and see how people process situations repeats and then all those things. And so I assigned a Metropolitan player to someone that I had coached and uh, that helped me sort of look at a game setting, understand emotionally how they probably handled what uh, took place in the game and uh, sort of tell that story in, in, in that way. Um, and then as I got deeper and deeper and deeper into the research, I began to, to see them for who they were as people rather than having to look through them uh, through the lens of guys that I coached. Uh, I started writing in uh, May of 2018, so I probably did a solid three months of research of just pulling every newspaper article for a couple of years in the Times, the PI, the Seattle Star, uh, and then a lot of the national publications too that did cover the event and I was just reading just trying to get my head around uh, you know what the story was and, and uh, I was trying to get my head around the historical aspects of it you know I think like a lot of people I understand World War II history fairly well uh, and I don't really under didn't understand World War I um, and it was interesting in, in the very first iterations of what I was writing I was looking at America through the lens of, of post-World War II, uh, and I had a history professor at the UW that was very helpful to me, and as I took my first sort of concepts in and was talking to her about it, she looked at it and said, you know, you're, you're looking at this in a World War II America, and World War I America is a completely different place with completely different ideals and thoughts and, uh, and, and all of those things, and you need to go back and learn more about World War I, and she gave me a bunch of things to read. So I went back and, and read it and understood it. And, and right at that point, America's not the global police force. Right? We do not want to be involved in foreign affairs. We don't want to have anything to do with these wars that are going on in Europe or in Mexico, because you have the Mexican Revolution going on at the same time. Uh, and it, it was really kind of interesting to get in there and see that as sort of the, the birth of, of the you know, America that we all grew up in, of being this uh, you know, superpower and, and global police force and, and really kind of controlling the you know, policies of, of what's happened around the world. Uh, so that was pretty cool to go in there and actually learn about this uh, this thing that is like our great grandparents had fought in this war, right? And it was like people that we knew and, and uh, it had been alive during this time period. So it was neat to, to understand that transition and all those things and then start to weave that into the, to the story. Um, when you, know, you first start writing, right, you typically will uh, 
write a couple of sample chapters and then you'll do uh, you know who your intended audience are or is and, and your marketing plan and all those things and you send it off to publishers and I was pretty lucky in that I had uh, a father of a kid that I had coached and that I was close with and I knew that he had written some books in the past uh, I didn't know anything more than that about what he had done and uh, reached out to him and just told him I was thinking about doing this and asked him if he would read the manuscript when I was done and, and he started laughing and said I will have my agents represent you you know and worst case scenario you know I'm uh, publishing books and I want to publish this and so uh, you know at that point I had two chapters written and uh, didn't really completely understand the story or how to, to write and I published her right and, and I don't think that that's the typical uh, process that most people go through. I think getting a publisher is very difficult. Um, that being said, it wasn't always easy or smooth from, from that point on. And uh, I wrote the end of the book first. You know, and it's for me, it was like I really understood the competitive aspects of it, I understood the coaching aspects of it, and so I wrote the the Stanley Cup final series because I could really explain what was happening from an athletic perspective, from a coaching perspective, and even though I don't understand hockey super well, emotionally I could explain what was happening. Uh, and, and you know, really be able to dive into that side of it. Uh, and then I get done with that and I have to go back and write chapter one. And I finished the last of the, the chapters that described the, the Stanley Cup final in probably the end of June. And from the end of June until the middle of August, I wrote chapter one at least 30 times. The first 29 times were so bad that I did save them so that at some point, uh, you know, I can go back and laugh at how bad the, the opening chapter is and its character development, right? So I went from having the ability to explain something that I completely understood of sports to going back and having to get people to care about the characters, and that was super challenging, right? And the first time I, I wrote chapter one, I, I got it done, and I was weaving all these, you know, there's uh, nine guys on a hockey team back then, and so I'm weaving the story to these nine guys through their trip out to Seattle, and, and it's super cool, and it's kind of a quirky way to do it, and I'm excited about it, and I hand it to my wife and a couple people that read it, and I, I, my wife gets two paragraphs in, and she's like, I'm so confused right now, I don't know what's going on, and you know, everyone else is like, no, it's terrible, you know, I mean, just to be blunt, this is really bad, and uh, my brother, same thing, called and said, no, you'll, you'll get this, don't worry about it, like, you got this, but this is really bad. You know, and I'm kind of thinking at that point, it's probably, by the time he read it, it was probably the 20th version of the, of the first chapter. Uh, and I you know, sent it off to the editor to look at, and got a document back probably two weeks later that was completely rewritten. She had just changed, all, like, you know, taken what I wrote conceptually and then wrote another story within it. She just ghost wrote it. It was so bad that, that she felt like that was the way that it would be easiest, and I was like, no, that's not the way that I'm, I don't want to do this, I want to figure this out, you know, I can do this. And uh, one thing that she did is she realigned all these like disparate threads that I'd written, and once I, I saw that, you could see that I'd repeated different aspects of the story like six times within the first chapter, and then I read it in, in sync, and it was terrible, right? So then you go through and you start cutting all these uh, redundancies out, and, and then start understanding like this part's actually not important right now, this part can come in later, and uh, it, it probably took me a, um, a day from that point until I actually had a, a workable chapter one, which was pretty crazy, it went fast, and then I can remember like handing it to my wife, she read it, she's like, oh, that's great, got it, you know, like it needs some refinement, but it's there, and then I remember sitting there looking at her and looking at the computer and going like, I have absolutely no idea how to start chapter two. And then, like, idea was in my head. I turned around and just typed the entire, like, first, uh, like, the open to the, the second chapter, which is, again, it's all character development. Turned around, handed it to her, thinking, like, I don't know how to go to the next piece. And then it was in my head, and then I just went. Uh, as soon as I got the, the second sort of part of the uh, second chapter out, I could see the rest of the book in my head, right? I knew that if I could just get to the first games of the, the team, that I knew the story from there on. And it was pretty neat. So that all happened in August of 2018, so a little over a year ago. And it took me probably six weeks to write the rest of the book. So I was done by the middle of October. Uh, maybe it was eight weeks, something like that. But I wrote the remaining 17 chapters in, in eight weeks and just flew. 
Um, and it's pretty neat at that point. You have a you know 82,000 word document that uh, you know you feel pretty good at reading it and looking at it. And at the same token, you're looking at it going like this is gonna read like a real book. You know, and I talk to my wife and I'd say like I just like it doesn't totally read like a real book yet. And she'd look at me and go yeah I, I agree like it's close. You know you just need someone to kind of come in and and shine it up and polish it and. I started reaching out to friends that I knew that had written books, and they all laughed. They're like, "Don't worry about it. That's why it's called a draft. You know, like this thing's gonna morph over the next couple of months as you go through the revision process." And uh, so I started doing the first revision. I think I took a week off between when I finished writing and when I started revising. So that was like early November of last year, and I did three full revisions, right, where I would revise the whole thing, take a week off, revise the whole thing, take a week off. And then I gave it to a couple of friends, and they read it, and gave me sort of broad strokes, um, you know, ideas of things that they would like, didn't like, and things like that. And then I did another big revision, and then I handed it to the editor at that point, and the editor takes it and does a huge revision. And, and at that point, we were tasked with cutting, I think, 3,000 words to tighten it up. And the editor gives me his manuscript, and uh, I put the two back together, and then did one final revision in early February of this year, where all they're doing is strengthening language, and it was pretty amazing where I'd finished the chapter, and at that point, the, the copy was, was tight enough to where I could look at it and say, like, hey, I could use one word for these three, or I could rearrange this sentence and it'll flow better, and then you get done with the chapter and you read it, and you're like, oh wow, it actually reads like a real book, this is really good, you know, and, and I would just get all the way through it, and then the funniest part is I got all the way to the end of the book, and like the third or the last chapter, I was like, I don't know what this is terrible. Like, what is this? And everyone laughed and like, well, we figured that the editor would catch that one. You know, and I'm like, no, you actually probably should have told me that. So then I went through and rewrote the, the uh, I think it, game two or game three of the Stanley Cup final. And it took me a day to do it. And it was really like clean and, and had the same sort of feel as the rest of the book. Uh, you know, and at that point I'm like super, excited and confident and feeling good and then I get the very last revision back from uh, the editor and it's like hey you should really think about you know adding this and this and, and the truth is the book ended on uh, the war declaration right and so it came back and he said you know I really struggle with having this incredible sports achievement where you know it really like it's emotional it's exciting it's all these things and then you turn the page to another chapter and this dry, bland, you know, Senate explanation and the vote on the war and all those things. Like you should really think about moving it before, you know, and chronologically you can't do that. It's like I can't change time or history and and you just sort of looking at it and he gave me like three other suggestions and he's like, you know, you totally let these go. You know, this is you know too late in the game and and at that point I'm thinking like I'm not sure that I can incorporate these in quickly and I've been writing you know, 10 to 15 hour days for the last six months. So I was actually, uh, you know, it's the quality of what I was writing was as good as it had been. And, and I looked at the manuscript and I was like, you know what, I can actually change the last chapter from chapter 25 to epilogue, which is what was next anyways, and just put the whole final chapter into the epilogue. And then his last adjustments took me 15 minutes to do. And I was shocked, I looked at it, I was like, I can't believe that actually came out of my head like that. You know, usually I'd write it, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, and then it would actually be readable. You know, and at that point, it was like just coming out of my head in a, in a finished product. So, shipped it off. Uh, you know, it, it goes to uh, to press, and you kind of sit there and hold your breath for a couple of weeks. And uh, I think that at that point, it's probably one of the scariest, most terrifying experiences that I've been through. Of, uh, you feel good about it. I mean, I felt really good about it. I felt like it was a spectacular story. It had a lot of human elements in that I thought would relate to people. Uh, I thought the timing was was really good. You know, I mean, we didn't set out to time it so that it all happened when the NHL Seattle was coming. But when I started researching it, the arena situation was still a mess, and didn't really know what was going to happen. And it all kind of came into focus as I was writing. Uh, you know, and so you look at this thing and you're like, the timing's good. Everything's good. I hope people like it, you know, when you put it out, and it was pretty crazy. You know, I think within a, a couple of hours of it being out, it was number one on Amazon for hockey books, and number one for Kindle sales for hockey books, and 
uh, and it stayed there for like six weeks, you know, and it was pretty crazy. I just looking at this thing going, like, okay, I there actually is a lot of uh, excitement in the region over, over hockey and, uh, you know, and then you feel pretty good about your ability to market something and, and sell it and get it out there, but you know that the real test is going to come a couple months down the road when the first wave of people actually read it and at that point, you know, the press is gone and, and the excitement's gone and now it's just if the story's good enough, right? And if people are telling their friends to read it and uh, if, if people are enjoying it and things like that and uh, luckily the word of mouth has been really strong and the feedback has been really good that people have actually really enjoyed the story and uh, which is just a huge relief, you know, and I mean I think for me as much as anything not knowing, uh, you know, through a lot of the process of what I was doing, I was just doing all of it by feel, you know, just reading it and saying would I like this as a reader, you know, would I want to know this and, you know, you just, you just sort of put yourself out there and, and do it and to have people enjoy the book has been really rewarding. Uh, to have people understand the story has been super rewarding. You know, again, I just see it through the lens of, of being an athlete. It's like you win a championship, you deserve to have people know your story and uh, know what you accomplished. And, and so it's been neat for people to go out and to do that, to read it. And some of the feedback I've gotten is like, you know, I, I kind of look at those guys like the 79 Sonics now or some of the other great you know, Husky teams that we've had and, and things like that. So uh, it definitely was a process that uh, was pushed me outside my comfort zone for a longer period of time than I think I've ever been pushed outside of it. Uh, it's something that I'm really glad that I did. You know, um, you know, if nothing more comes of this than, than this, it was well worth it. Uh, the agents all started pushing movie rights uh, a couple months ago, which is pretty neat. It definitely would be a very cool story just with the time period and, and with uh, what actually happens on the ice uh, make for a pretty compelling movie and so that would definitely be neat for uh, you know the families of the, the players to, to be able to see the, that you know on a big screen and most of those people still live in Seattle you know I think uh, five of the nine players came back and raised their families in Seattle when they were finished playing and you know now we're on grandkids and great grandkids but you know the book launch we probably had you know 20 people from Frank Boyston's family there and we had you know, 10 or 12 of the Patricks, and uh, I had talked to uh, Coley Wilson's, you know, niece and nephew, and I had talked to um, Pete Muldoon's grandkids, and I had talked to Roy Ricky's grandkids, and so all these people are, are out there and, and still in the community and around, and so it's been pretty neat for you know, them to kind of get to understand the story a little bit better and, and all that stuff. So, yeah. Talk about the rivalry with I, I think what I took away from the book was, oh wow, these two cities have been going at it for a long time. Yeah, uh, it, that was really neat, uh, you know, and it wasn't a clean rivalry, right? I mean, it was, uh, there was pure hatred. Uh, I mean, it, I, I shouldn't say that, that's not the right word, but it definitely rivals the, the rivalry with the Timbers, you know, it's just like it's emotional and, uh, you know, and, and the rivalry with the millionaires was also, uh, really neat for me to, to see. You know, I thought that you, know, you could see there was just really deep respect between the Metropolitans and the Millionaires, and you could see that the, the Metropolitans were absolutely not going to lose the Rosebuds. No matter what happened, they were not going to lose those games. You know, and unfortunately they did. They lost a lot of them. Uh, and it, it was neat. You know, and there's part of me that looks at the, you know, with the NHL uh, coming to Seattle, how neat that rivalry is going to be. You know, and like the throwback games will be fun with the the Canucks, and, and I'm hopeful that the rivalry is as strong as the Millionaires the Metropolitan's rivalry. Um, you know, it'd be fun to see Portland get a team. It'd be fun to see Portland continue to get more teams where we could have that rivalry back. But yeah, they, I mean, they hated each other. And the thing that's so interesting to me was just, you know, the Rosebuds were so good at getting the Metropolitan's outside of, the, of their game. You know, they just made them. And, Lots of fights and lots of aggressive play and aggressive tactics, and it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and again, I think that's another thing that's really neat for me too is is uh, you know the NHL Seattle people. I think there's a strong possibility that the team will not be named the Metropolitans, which I think that I'm fine with. I think a lot of us are fine with it. Uh, 
you know, it's important to me that the banners get raised. You know, it's a community's uh, achievement, and uh, you know, it's something that should be celebrated. It's like those grandkids should be able to walk inside that arena and, and see that banner hanging there and know that their grandparents did that. Uh, you know, I'd love to see statues of the Hall of Famers go up in front of the arena. You know, it's like there's three guys that are in the Hall of Fame because of what they did for the Metropolitans, and there should be a fourth. You know, Bernie Morris should definitely be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and like I sent a bunch of stuff back to the Hall of Fame uh, a while back, just you know, asking them to take another look at it, and they should. You know, I mean, he's definitely a worthy candidate. Um, but it's neat. You know, so the team was here for nine years. Uh, they uh, were the the best team in the nine years that they were here. They had the highest winning percentage. Uh, they edged out the Millionaires by just a few games. Uh, they competed for the Stanley Cup in 1919 and 1920. The 1919 series, they're absolutely destroying the Canadians. Um, and through a, a few fluke events, the Canadians have the games tied, so the Metropolitans have outscored the Canadians like 25 to 10, something like that. That's not the actual numbers, but it's something similar. Uh, but the game scores are tied at 2-2 two, two, uh, and 1. The tie game is you know, considered one of the greatest games ever played. It's a 0-0 tie through two overtimes. Uh, and guys start to collapse at the end of the, the game and no one can figure out what's going on. And then the Metropolitans are up three goals uh, going into the third period of the next game and all they have to do is hold off the, the Canadians and they win. And the Metropolitans typically play best at the end of the game and so most people in the arena thought they were going to hold them off and win the thing and they fell apart again. Uh, and guys are collapsing and no one knows what's going on and, and Bernie Morris, who's one of the star players, is actually not playing in the series because he's in prison in Fort Lewis and he's been arrested for, for draft evasion and that story is spectacular. Uh, but what, what happens is the players all wake up the day after the uh, game of the Metropolitan lose late and the Spanish flu that's been ravaging the world has hit Seattle and it kills one of the Canadians players and uh, a bunch of the Mets are, are sick, and a bunch of Canadians are sick, and the Canadians don't have enough players to build the team anymore. And so they offer a fourth of the series, and the Metropolitans won't accept it, not winning on, on the ice, and so it goes down as a tie. And in 1920, the Metropolitans lose to the uh, Ottawa Senators in five games. And that's the last time they played for the Cup. So they still won the Pacific Coast Hockey Association two other times, but lost in the playoffs, and so never played for the Cup. One, one, and one, and the Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, uh, you know, both years, so 1970 and 1919, they're above the rings, and so they're on the actual cup. They're on like the second last tier of the cup, so they'll never go away. So they'll always be there. It's a pretty neat thing. Yeah. And we good on time. Plenty of time. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions about any other aspects of it? So the, the process for getting someone considered for the Hall of Fame right now, you just have to make your case and put, put as much information in their hands as possible and hope that someone picks up the cops, right? Because there's no one, no surviving people that yeah. saw them. No. Been, yeah. There's like a committee of 10 people that, that decide that. And I give my note back to him. It's like I can't tell you the difference between a Hall of Famer and you know, someone that's really, really close. And so here's all the information. You guys make the best decision. Um, you know, and it's interesting. So Bernie Morris ends up. Uh, he loses the 1920 season because he's he gets sent, convicted of draft evasion and he gets sent out to trial as a Canadian citizen. As a Canadian citizen, yeah, uh, which is you know obviously a, a huge point of consternation for everybody. There's a treaty that's signed between the two countries that if you lived in, in the other uh, country, you're subject to their draft. Um, so he misses the 1920 season. He ends up getting his conviction overturned uh, in March of 1920, and they send him back to Ottawa to play in the Stanley Cup final that year. And he, uh, you know, it's just like, you miss a year in your prime, and it's, it's hard to recover from that. They knew that. What they didn't know is he had also missed the 1915 season. And so there's a huge player war that's been going on between the NHA and the PCHA. And the, the, the Pacific Coast Hockey Association owners are the Patrick, Lester, and, and Frank. 
Uh, and if you've seen Miracle, their grandson is Craig, who's the assistant coach of the 1980 Olympic hockey team. And so the Patricks have really good relationships with everybody uh, in hockey, and so they're coaching all the best players from the East and pulling them over. And they basically leverage that to uh, get the two leagues to play for the Stanley Cup. And so that's how that comes to be. So in 1915, they, they set this series up, and, and the winner of the West Coast is going to play the winner of the East Coast uh, for the Cup. And they play the series, and Victoria, who's Lester Patrick's team, wins. And you know they think they win the Stanley Cup. And the Stanley Cup trustees come back and say, like, no one asked us. right? So great series. Congratulations to Victoria. This has nothing to do with the Stanley Cup, though. If you guys want this to be for the Stanley Cup, we need to actually sit down and talk this through. And so they all sat down. and. and came to an agreement that they wouldn't poach each other's players anymore, and they created a line of demarcation that went through North America, and all players on the East would stay in the Eastern Leagues, and all players on the West would stay in the Western Leagues, and they said 1916 is the first year. Uh, my years are off. So 1914 is the year that the Victoria played, and, and it didn't count. Uh, the 1915 would be the first year that the two leagues would actually play for the Cup, and Vancouver wins it that year. Uh, and Bernie Morris had already signed with the Ottawa Bulldogs, who had won two consecutive Stanley Cups, and uh, was going back east. And this agreement gets put in place after he's agreed. So it's, it's kind of an awkward thing. He's not very educated. He's not very um, you know, worldly and sort of all those things. And so he gets caught up in it. And the league suspends him. The PCHA suspends him for the year and won't let him play in either league. So in five years of these two leagues fighting over players, he's the only player that's suspended. And he's just basically you know, uh, an example to be made for everyone else. And so he misses two full seasons outside of his control. And so once I figured that out, I sent that back to the Hall of Fame and asked them to look at it. And you know, that was sort of the reason that they were taking it up again. It's just we missed two full seasons. It's interesting, like his stats for the first four seasons that he's in Seattle, he's, you know, if not the best player in the league, he's certainly in the top two or three. Cyclone Taylor with the millionaires is, you know, a special player. Uh, but Bernie's stats are just like the two of them are head and shoulders above everyone else. And then when he comes back after his incarceration, he's kind of a different player. And it's still good. You know, he's still like in the top five of, of everything. Um, but I think in his eight seasons in Seattle, uh, if you look at you know his goals totals, assists total, and his points total, I think I figured out that he was in the top two in the league, eleven of the sixteen you know possibilities for those those three categories. You know, I mean that's pretty dramatic, right? Not top five, not top ten, top two. You know, um, so he's got the all-time uh, points record for the league. Uh, you know, what he does in the 1917 Stanley Cup final is dramatic and, you know, in and of itself, probably worthy of consideration. So, yeah. What about the millionaire story? Has someone told that? Uh, you found anything yeah, I mean, there's some good books that are more historical, uh, less narrative, and, and uh, they have some good, like, basically just explaining what happened every year in the PCHA. Uh -huh. um, you know, and the millionaires, so the, the Metropolitans disband, and the millionaires disband, and the uh, Victoria franchise moves to Detroit and becomes the Red Wings, and the Portland franchise moves to Chicago and becomes the Blackhawks. Yeah, so two of the original six teams are you know, from the PCHA. Yeah, yeah. And then the Boston Bruins, when they get um, formed in 1924, there's two players, so Bobby Rowe and Bernie Morris are both on the inaugural Boston Bruins team. So I think, uh, I want to say seven of the nine guys are on, you know, the first teams for the Red uh, uh, Blackhawks, the Red Wings, and the, the Bruins. So, yeah. And didn't the Victoria team move to Spokane for a period? Just for the 1917 season. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so their arena is commandeered by the Canadian military as a weapons depot. So they take the team and, and move to Spokane. 
and it's an outdoor venue, so it doesn't it has a a roof over it, but it's not completely enclosed, and so uh, it, they struggle to get fans there. And it's interesting; it's in kind of an industrial part of, of the city. I went there last summer when I was in Spokane. It's just a complete empty lot right now. So, yeah. How do they keep the, the ice cool? And, you know, that technology seems like uh, it needs to take a lot of, a lot of work and effort. Like that. Yeah, so it was state of the art when it was built, and just in a classic Seattle story. Within two years, it was an obsolete arena, and that was part of the reason that the, the team left too. Was, uh, the plans called for like around you know 35 to 400, 4,000. Uh, seats and it ends up being 2,500. It had seats on three ends of it, so one end was, uh, you know, just kind of like a big theater type wall, uh, and uh, I can't remember the exact uh, mileage of the pipes underneath, but it's pretty dramatic. I want to say it's like seven miles of pipe that ran underneath the ice, and the Patricks had worked with somebody and they developed a, a specific brine, and that's how they did it. So the brine would, uh, you know, stay colder than freezing. They would just run it through these pipes, and it would keep the surface cold. You know, and it was not something that, that had been done before, right? So all the eastern rinks were all natural ice. Uh, they just stayed frozen. So by the end of the season, they would would be soft and kind of slushy. And um, you know, it, it was really state of the art. It was pretty cool. So, and the, I knew all of that because a, a, a friend of mine that's a big collector in the city had. He had all the documents from when the arena was built, and so I was able to go through and look at uh, like these plans that they had created. It was essentially a book to go out and get investors to put money in. So, so the, the building's obsolete within a couple of years, and, and the team leaves, yeah. disbands, so did it get torn down? No, so they, they the extra palms are good, right? So people are coming, people are still into it, people are excited about it, and the, the Olympic Hotel is built, and uh, they need a parking garage. And so the University of Washington owns all that land. It's the Metropolitan Track, which is where the name comes from. And the hotel went to the, the UW and basically said, we want that uh, arena as our parking garage. You need to kick them out. And the team still had a year left on the lease. Uh, and you know, like it had done well. The league had done well. But then uh, at the same time, the Eastern uh, you know, arenas all were out seating 10,000 people, right? And I think Portland was close to like five or 6,000, and Vancouver was five or 6,000. And Seattle's 2,500 seating, you know, you could get up to 3,500 with standing room only. Um, and so the Patricks were kind of losing money on the whole thing, and, and the UW said, here's a chunk of cash, you know, this should make you whole for you know, any sort of operating losses you've had over the last couple of years, but the team's got to get out now. And so they spent a couple of months trying to get another arena built and couldn't pull it off and so they disbanded. the team disbands late. So around like August of 1924 and the players all scatter, they all go up to Victoria, the, the star players all go to Victoria and, uh, and help them win the Stanley Cup and they become the last non-NHL team to win the Cup in 1926. Um, and yeah. And it's like the original arena politics is totally going on for 100 plus years here. Yeah. So Pete Muldoon, the head coach, goes down to Portland and coaches the Rosebuds for the last year, and then he goes with the team to Chicago, and he becomes the first head coach in Blackhawks history. Hates it, comes back after a year, and uh, you know spends a year or two trying to get the arena built, and they get the Mercer arena built. So he's actually the person that pulls that off, which just got torn down a couple years ago. Um, yeah. So a lot of history woven through. Yeah, he really was. I mean, uh, I, I think the thing that was most interesting to me about people doing is uh, he'd be considered new school today. You know, it was 100 years ago. He was just a guy that really understood people and uh, understood sports and could really explain it. You know, that was kind of neat for me to see that. And that was, went into that whole thing of not really understanding what sports are going to be like. You just figure the head coach is going to yell and scream and, uh, you know. Yeah, for sure. And you could you could really see how much respect the players had for him too. There's a lot of sort of anecdotes over the years. You know, so the players stay famous until the late 40s, and I mean they are super famous. 
when this whole thing's happening. Uh, you know, and there are stories in the 30s and in the early 40s where they would get together and have breakfast and one overall would join them or other people would see them. And then they would write about, you know, all the hockey guys all got together last night and things like that. And so a lot of the stories that were in the book came out through a lot of those episodes. And you know, it was pretty interesting. It was really, really evident how much they respected Muldoon. Uh, you know, and then Frank Poiston becomes the head coach of the minor league team when Muldoon has a heart attack and dies. And, 1929. He's 41 years old, uh, and uh, you know, it takes a couple of years before Poison comes back. And he actually writes a column in the Seattle Times for like every Saturday for two months during the hockey season. And he's telling the stories of uh, you know, the old you know, Mets rivalries and the uh, you know what happened in the 1917 season. And he kind of goes into detail about the 1919 game, the 0-0 game. And so again, a lot of the the stories that are sort of woven into what's happening in the game recaps are all from his stories. Later. Yeah, later. It was so factual at the time. You didn't get that narrative around the game. You can tell so beautifully where you can feel the ebb and flow. You can tell what's happening and the emotional yeah. roller coaster the team's on. Yeah. 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 To even be able to put those things back together just through the box scores. Uh, you know, there's a funny sort of scene in there where they signed Roy Ricky a couple weeks into the 1917 season, and he's really young. And, uh, is he on Portland? And then he was in Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah. And then Frank Patrick is not going to play, so retire, and then he decides he is going to play, and so they need the roster spot, so they cut Roy Ricky, and he comes to Seattle, and Royal Brome is you know, writing about how Roy Ricky's playing so well, and you know he's doing all these fantastic things. And at the same time, Coley Wilson, who's like the emotional heartbeat of the Metropolitans, is getting in like 16 fights a period. You know, and you can tell that Muldoon's getting super frustrated with Coley Wilson not being able to control his emotions. And I'm kind of reading all these box scores, and seeing this, and I'm like, I can't wait till this thing plays out. And then, you know. Three days later, or something like that, it's announced that Roy Ricky's going to start in front of Coley Wilson, and Rob Roll writes this big thing about how, you know, young Ricky's just played so well, he's pushed Coley Wilson out of the starting lineup, and I'm like, that's not what happened. Like, I can guarantee you the conversation went like, you want to not control your emotions out on the ice? Like, this is what the bench looks like. You know, you come sit next to me, and when you can actually figure out how to play within the constructs of what we're doing, you'll be back on the ice. Not doing yeah. Good yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, and it was interesting that in like one of my favorite things I found when I looked at that is that very game, uh, Coley Wilson has an assist to Roy Ricky. You know, and again, that, that wasn't something that was talked about in the game recap, but I'm looking at the box score, and that's actually a really indicative thing of, of the heartbeat of this team, right? You have a guy pass to his teammate that just took his starting spot, you know, and, and it's the most emotional guy on the team too, right? It's the one guy that shouldn't be okay with that, and he was. Uh, and yeah, and fun we've been 